Hey, I'm Mark Beebe, believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with codependency. It's great to be with you. We're going to continue um, talking tonight about strongholds. We did an introduction, uh, what strongholds are all about last week. And I'd encourage you, if you missed that, to uh, um, take a look at that as we kind of move our way forward. And so now we're going to be looking at a variety of um, specific and individualized uh, strongholds. And, and we're going to be working on pride first. Let's pray together. Sweet Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you and for the opportunity for you to move into our hearts and to break up the log jams, the strongholds that are there. We ask you to do that right now and along the way as we work our way through this, this teaching, Lord. And just uh, we ask you to set us free from ourselves and make us people that are available to you. In your sweet name we pray, amen. So um, as Alex was saying, lots is changing in a hurry with uh, what we're able to do in terms of recovery here at Cokesbury. And so I would really encourage you, pay attention to the recovery at Cokesbury website, recoverycokesbury.com. You'll see updated information um, there about what groups are going to be going online temporarily and um, how all that is going to work, what the, what the um, links are for those groups. And um, all of that will be available in an updated basis as often as possible. And we will also be um, obviously sending out social media, um, updating you as well. If you've never um, joined us on Facebook, you've never joined us on, um, on Twitter, I would encourage you to do that and um, be a part of that social media. You'll get even more updated information uh, right there. So let's talk about pride. Here's a great, here's a great quote. Pride is cosmic arrogance. It shows its ugly head in our unreasonable sense of self-importance, in our belief that our way is always the right way, in our search for self-glorification, in our conceit in our own abilities, and in our contempt for the abilities of others. Pride is revealed in our boastfulness, hypocrisy, and arrogance, in our impatience with and disdain for others, in our insatiable desire for recognition, our discontent when it's given, and our rage when it's withheld. It's from a guy, Father Jerry Kistler. Man, it's just, uh, that speaks volumes. And, and the, 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 we talked last week about the fact that strongholds, are, have like a slow trickle effect. They're not like a waterfall. They're like a slow trickling of water coming down a stream and slowly and slowly and slowly that, that uh, trickle creates an erosion in that, stream, in that stream bed, in the rock bed maybe of that stream. And as time goes along and along and along pretty soon, it builds into a waterfall and that waterfall gets larger and it eventually becomes overwhelming. But the seductive side of Strongholds is important to be able to see. It starts off with, um, it starts off like this in the very first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis. And God says something very simple and very basic to Adam and Eve. He begins to talk to them about what healthy authority looks like. He tells them he loves them. He tells them he's provided for them everything that they need. He tells them that they can trust him. He tells them that they can walk in fellowship with him. He tells them that he designed them to be with him. He tells them all of that. He provides Adam and Eve with absolute and complete security. The ultimate gift that we're, we're all, every one of us, we're all looking for, right? Right? And then along comes a slow trickle, and it sounds like, a lot like the voice of the enemy. And that's because it is. And that voice can sometimes function kind of like a slow trickle. And so you can imagine the enemy, enemy coming up beside Adam and Eve, one of them or both of them or however. And he gets up close and he goes, let me, let me ask you a question. I mean, are you sure of what God said to you? Like what happened was God says to Adam and Eve, you have this whole garden, you have everything in it, everything you could ever need. I do not want you. This is the healthy authority issue. I do not want you. I'm asking you not to eat from the, tree, the fruit of this particular tree back there. 
And if you do, he says, you will surely die. And so the enemy comes up and you can imagine him whispering in Adam's ear, do, do, you, do, you, do you really think that God meant for you not to um, eat from that tree? I mean, what's so important about the tree? There must be something important about that tree if God is trying to tell you not to eat from it. What do you think it is? What do you think it is? Don't, don't you think you should check it out? And here's the trickle. Don't you think you ought to check that out? Don't you want to see what God is trying to withhold from me? Because after all, and here's a salient point, after all, is it really true? Do you think that you can actually trust God? Do you actually think that you can trust God? That's a yes or no. Do you? Do you think you can trust God? Do you really think you can trust God? Don't you think you ought to go be able to figure out a way to trust yourself, you and Eve? Go back there and check it out and see what God might be withholding from you. And the soon as that idea is planted in their head, they're off to the races. And now you can imagine that slow trickle becoming faster and faster and faster and more and more erosion of the bedrock of the security that God has promised Adam and Eve, more and more erosion of that, less and less confidence in what God said, less and less confidence in the way God is loving them, and pretty soon they're off on the path, walking down through eight million other trees to get to that one. And that's, that's kind of like what pride does. It erodes the confidence that we have in our interdependence, in our fellowship relationship, in our trust of others. And it really says to us, if I can become good enough, fast enough, strong enough, smart enough, you know what, if I can become king of the hill, if I can get to that point, I can, be, I can have a sense of the fact that I created my own security. I created my own security. That's what, that's what the enemy is driving on. That's the way the trickle starts. That's the slow water flow in the heart of, of those guys. And so it's like, it's one thing, it's one thing to go, man, you know, I worked hard on this achievement. And I have a satisfaction of what I was able to accomplish. You know, I worked hard on finishing school and I got the degree and I'm satisfied that that happened. I worked hard on getting a promotion and I'm satisfied that I got there and I, I, I'm satisfied with the outcome. I worked hard to get back into shape or lose weight or whatever and I'm satisfied that I was able to do that. I've worked hard to improve my finances and I'm satisfied that I was able to do that. I have a satisfaction even about, I have a satisfaction about um, getting sober, you know, becoming, what, learning what it's like to be free from the bondage of the compulsion that I was in the middle of. You know, I have a satisfaction of the freedom that I'm experiencing from the stronghold that has had my life strangled for so long. You know, and it's a satisfaction though, that's a satisfaction that's healthy is a satisfaction that also comes consummate with gratitude. I'm satisfied at what I was able to accomplish, but I'm grateful that God gave me that opportunity. I'm satisfied that my children were able to graduate from high school or graduate from college or get this great job, but I'm satisfied that they were able to accomplish, accomplish that and I'm proud of them, but you know what? I'm also grateful. I'm so very grateful that God gave those children to me, gave them to me for a while to raise up, even though they still belong to him, I'm grateful that God gave them to me so I could have the opportunity to experience that joy of what they were able to do. That, that's, the, that's the balance of gratitude. And when you take the balance of gratitude out, you say, well, when my child became a doctor, when my child did something that you know is significant, graduated, got a degree, whatever it is, has this good job, has children, got married, is in a healthy marriage, is doing something significant for others. When I see my child doing that, man, I'm gonna take all the credit because you know what, I, it's my kid, I instilled that in them, I did that, I accomplished it, I accomplished it, it's so good. No gratitude. And then the pride starts to deteriorate the security that God says to you, I want to give this to you. I don't need you to figure out a way to do it. I want to give this to you. And so pretty much anything that seems innocently just, uh, 
joy filled for us where we can go, man, I'm so happy that that happened. And I, I, I mean, I take, you know, the, the phrase, I take so much pride in that. It's like, great that you take pride in that accomplishment, but let me ask you, is there gratitude that is attached? Is there gratitude that is attached? Because if we're gonna get to the point of number one, the stronghold of pride, number one, really pushes our buttons relative to performance and in performance orientation. That is to say like a value system where the number of points that I rate myself on are based on what I am able to actually accomplish in my life. And so that in and of itself, that can become a terrific stronghold of feeling inadequate, feeling unworthy, feeling unaccomplished, feeling insignificant, feeling worthless. And in order, to, in order to deal with the power of a stronghold or the power of a, of a, of a compulsion, man, that's gonna be probably our worst enemy. The enemy that says, you know what? You don't, you don't really deserve to be free from that. You brought this on, you live with it. You don't really deserve to have freedom in your life. You don't really deserve to have what God calls the abundant life. You don't really deserve it. That, he wrote that for somebody else, man. Because look at your earnings. Look at, look, at your, look at your earnings based on your performance. Let's look at your performance sheet. Let's look at the scorecard and it isn't very good. It isn't very good. And so pride, what it does is it, it eventually is gonna rob us. It's gonna rob us of the love of grace. And it's gonna rob us of the grace that is love. And it's gonna rob us of the opportunity that God wants to have to put his hands on you, put his hands up to your face and say, you know what, Mark Beebe, you're my own. You belong to me. I laid down the life of my son, Jesus, for you. I want you to know how much I love you. Keep looking right at me, Mark. I want you to know how much I love you. And I want you to know how important you are to me. And I want you to know how much I want you to be free. And I want you to know how much I want you to have this abundance, this fullness that I keep talking to you about. And pride when I'm basically going, I'm gonna go my own because I wanna accomplish it all by myself and I want everything that I do to be just me and I wanna be the one that can sit back and, and go, yeah, you know what? Like, uh, I mean, I did that. I mean, like I did that. Look, look, at, look at what I did. Look at what she did. But you know, I really taught her everything she knows. I mean, look at what he did. Look, look at that. And I mean, conversely, when we go down this performance track, with, at least with our children, problem's gonna be that not only are we gonna take far too much credit for what they accomplished, because we have no gratitude balancer. But also we're gonna take far too much credit then, because the converse would be true, far too much credit for what they screw up. We're gonna take far too much responsibility for what they screw up. Pride gets us there. Another piece of the stronghold of pride is this, is it, it really creates in us an attitude of superiority and a contempt for people, places, or things that I perceive based on my superiority that I perceive to be less than. So if you're not as good as me, if you're not better than me, if you're not hanging with me, if you're not as successful as me, as effective as me, man, I just have, I have less respect for you. It's kind of like, I mean, I tell people all the time, always go back, always go back to beginner's meetings. If you're going to Al-Anon, take the turn once in a while. If there's, there's a breakout meeting at the meeting you go to for beginners, take the opportunity to go lead that meeting and listen to where people really are. And see, pride's gonna say, well, man, I used to be there. I'm not there now. That's stupid that they think that. Why do they talk like that? Why do they do like that? Why don't they know better? What's the matter with them? Gratitude goes, man, I remember. I remember where I was exactly there. I remember the night that I was exactly there. I remember the weeks, the months, the years that I was right there. I remember. And I'm grateful for the way that God has set me free. 
I'm grateful for the way that Jesus has set me free. I'm grateful for the way that this program has set me free. And I'm going to remember that gratitude. And now instead of me going, dismissing this person as sort of being, you know, like such a rookie and have no idea what they're talking about, I'm going to learn to develop a generosity of compassion for them. A generosity of compassion of saying, I remember when I was stuck there. I remember when that stronghold was dominating my life. I remember when this compulsion was dominating my life. I remember when I knew nothing about freedom. I remember when I knew nothing about God trying to speak to me. I remember when I wasn't hearing anything God was trying to say. And man, I wanna be able to do whatever it is I can do, whatever it is I can do, to be there for somebody else who's in that kind of pain and in that kind of bondage and living out of that kind of a, of a stronghold. And, and that prideful attitude of superiority will take me right away from that opportunity. The belief that because somebody doesn't know, doesn't have, doesn't do what I do, that they're inferior, that they're inferior is going to distance and separate me from yet another person. Instead of me increasing the fellowship in my life, pride is going to cause me to decrease the fellowship in my life. What it's going to do is it's going to cause me to basically believe that I'm untouchable. And I'm untouchable because everybody else around me is less than. You know what it's like when there's somebody in your life, maybe you have somebody in your family or a friend or whatever, you know, or used to be a friend where they basically, despite anything we're talking about, they know, they know pretty much everything about everything. Doesn't matter. I know everything about everything. They're not willing to ever go. You know what, man? I, have, I do not know anything about that. You know, you're talking about boats or whatever. I don't, I don't know really anything about boats. Teach me about boats. I don't know anything about golf. Teach me about golf. Of course, with golf, you know, those uh, people tell me that they play golf all the time. They're like, yeah, the more you learn about golf, the less you know about golf. So I'm not, sure, I'm not really positively sure if anybody knows as much as they would like to know about golf. It's just one of those frustrating sports. But the belief that the belief that I'm untouchable because I'm um, almost invincible or I'm almost, uh, you know, people are not where I am. And pride drives that. Pride drives a feature of perception. And the feature of perception that it drives is I have a penchant. I have a, a, a hot desire to do this, to look down to look down on people, not to look at people, to look down on people, places, things, whatever, and not to look right at them, to look down on them for what is wrong and not to look at them to see what their gift is or what their opportunity is. You know, that thing we were just reading, you know, the, the, we're just gonna, we're gonna read, you know, the serenity prayer, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Man, pride would be all over that statement. It would say, oh, no, 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 let's opt out of that one. Let's, uh, let's opt out of accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Let's not do that. Let's figure out some ingenious way to avoid hardship altogether and then say, you know, there used to be that there was hardship in my life, but I've conquered that now. And so we would say, we would change the prayer and it would go, because I'm so, because I'm so capable, avoiding hardship because I already know how to have peace. That's how that prayer would go. But see, it doesn't say that. Because recovery doesn't say that. The looking down part of pride, I know better, it causes us to miss the vision that is coming from other people and from good recovery. I know I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying about, I, I need to do this. I need to, like we were talking about willingness the other week, you know, you look at the rhythm of, of recovery. Rhythm of recovery is you need to be able to arrest your disease, whether it's treatment or how, however that's going to happen. You got to arrest the, the authority of the disease. You got you to gotta have someone to talk to. You got to have some established fellowship. You need a sponsor. You need to be able to read the literature to learn a different, how to build a different frame for your life. You need to be able to go to meetings again to reinforce that new frame and, and also accelerate and expand the fellowship. And you, you know, on the look down, you're like, I know, but like, I'm not like that. I'm not really like that. I don't, I don't really need all that. Like I just got the ability to just stop if I want to. It's like, well, if that's true, then you're overusing something, but you don't have a compulsion. But we'll find out. 
We're going to find out. <laughs> We're going to find bondage always shows its ugly face. Bondage always shows its ugly face. Compulsion always shows its ugly face. It can only go in hiding temporarily. It's always going to show its ugly face. And the more prideful we are about how we're going to do it and the way we're going to see it and the way we're going to, we're going to address this, the sicker we're going to get. And the more convinced we are that we can do it better, differently than these thousands and hundreds of thousands of other people that have gotten sober before us, the sicker we're going to get. Looking down robs us of the life vision that God is trying to make available to us through himself, through other people, through this program, through meetings, through all of it. Pride always has a capacity of saying, no matter what else happens, I have a constant preference of myself. Like if someone says to you in a group, man, can you write down, this is something people generally are gonna do when they have a um, interview, a structured interview. So you go into the interview and they're gonna go, tell me all that, you know, you give them your resume. Then they're gonna give you a piece of paper and they're gonna go, can you write down and let's talk about it here. I'm gonna give you five minutes to write down the three things in the last year and a half of your life that you really felt like you did well. You really came out well. You got something significant accomplished. You learned something major or whatever. So you write that down. Then they're gonna go, we would like you to write down the three major things right now that you would describe as weaknesses that you have. And all of a sudden, because you're only, you're, you're, never, you're, only, you're, you're never looking down, you're only looking at yourself, you're depending on the high quality of yourself, that's what pride does, and the high completion of yourself, that's what pride does. You are really gonna struggle mightily with writing down those three things. That's what the constant preference of self looks like. And the constant preference, I prefer myself to others, also is gonna impact my relationship with God, isn't it? Because my preference for myself is gonna lessen and diminish my preference for God. Even though, back to the Adam and Eve story, God's like, I made you, I created you, birthed you, gave you breath, caring for you, providing for you, giving you everything you need. But see, you went to that tree and you went to the one that he was telling you, you know, don't go to that tree. And you went there because you wanted to know exactly how you could play the role of God so you could step around God and you could basically kind of like buy and wholesale. You could buy, you could buy life wholesale and do it better, quicker, faster, stronger. You have a preference of self over God. You have an excessive belief. This is all part of the same stronghold, you have, which is why it's so deadly. It's so deadly because there's no room for anybody else's breath. There's no room for anybody else's influence. There's no, there's no room for anybody else's direction. There's no room for anybody else's experience, strength, or hope. You are in the shutdown mode because you are so convinced that only you have it right. Ever felt like that? I have an excessive belief in my own abilities and that excessive belief in my own abilities, the preference thing, it short circuits grace. Because now back to the deal of what's the performance scoreboard you're living on, I believe, I believe that I have earned what God has given to me. I have earned it. That means I'm in charge of it. That means there's no God coming to you and saying, I wanna, I wanna give this to you because I love you. You didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it, you can't buy it, you can't pay it back, you can't equal the score, I'm giving this to you. Excessive belief in my own abilities short circuits grace. Pride short circuits grace. And eventually, when enough pride builds up in me, I'm going to get to the exact statement that the enemy wants me to get to with this particular stronghold. And that is, out of my mouth, in my head, comes the thought, 
you know what? I, I mean, I really, am, I really can do everything God does for me. I mean, I really am pretty much God for me. And now I have created out of this separation because of now the trickle of the water going over, the little, the little, uh, the little uh, vertical, little, little vertical place in this stream, now it's become a full-blown waterfall. And now I've created a separation between me and God. And pride did that. And the enemy wanted that. And that's the stronghold. It's a, the outcome of strongholds is always the same. It's wrecking you. It's wrecking your relationship with God. It's wrecking your relationship with others. And it's strangling, maybe slowly but surely, but definitely deliberately, it's strangling the life out of you, often without you being fully aware. Let me ask you a question. To get back to that deal of, of a feeling of worthlessness and the danger that that brings to opportunities for freedom from strongholds, do you think that it's a form of pride when I begin to explain to God what a horrible person I am, how I've wrecked my life, what, uh, how worthless I am and how, how completely incapable I'm ever going to be of experiencing sobriety or freedom. And the loathing that I go through becomes stronger and stronger and stronger in my life. And I become more and more convinced of my in, the incapacity that I have to receive freedom, hope, grace, the glory of God in my life, and, and a release from the stronghold that is in me? Is that a form of pride? Am I really trying to say to God, God, I'm going to tell you how you can love me? And even more clearly, God, you know what? I'm going to actually tell you, I'm going to tell you if, if, you can love me. I'm going to tell you, God, if you can love me. And so you can only love me, God, if I say you can love me. Well, see, that just isn't true. Doesn't say, it doesn't say in the Bible, well, God was in Christ reconciling the people that allowed him to love him to love them to himself. It says God was in Jesus reconciling the whole world to himself. The whole world to himself. So when I get to that point of believing that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like unapproachable, um, I can't be healed, I can't be helped, I can't be set free. Now I'm going to do something even more dangerous. I'm going to go, because it doesn't make any difference anyway, because it doesn't make any difference anyway, because there is no hope for me or there is no freedom for me. I don't need this armor of God stuff. I don't need to put on the armor of God that we read about. I don't need the breastplate and the helmet and the shoes and all that. I don't need all that to deal with the enemy because you know what? It doesn't matter. Why don't you just take me? I don't need the armor of God. We're going to talk about the armor of God in one of these talks probably. I mean, and now I'm basically going, I don't, I don't really need that. I don't need that because I don't deserve it and I'm not worth it. And now I'm in control. That would be the example of how I'm in control of the way of the way I believe that God should love me or not love me because I'm going to tell God how he gets to love. I want to show you an example of the opposite of pride and the way that the enemy tried to use pride and who he tried to use it with. So this shows up in second half of the Bible, uh, the third book of the second half of the Bible, Luke. And so you have in the beginning of the story of Luke, you have the story about Jesus' birth and you have, you have all of that. And you have the story of Jesus' baptism. And then you have this story about how the enemy tries to create a stronghold in Jesus. Tells you a lot, doesn't it, about how forceful and how intense and how demanding the enemy is that he would go, he would freely go after Jesus, which he does. So in this story, Jesus goes out to be alone with his father in the wilderness. 
He's out there 40 days. And the enemy comes to him. And he starts to use the phrase, if you are, if you are the son of God, if you are such a hot shot, if God loves you so much, if you have all this authority, then you should take, he uses several things, you should take stones. One of them is you should take these stones, turn them into bread, and prove to me that you have that kind of power. And Jesus pretty much gives him the same answer every time. Not my job. Not, not, not what I'm doing here. Another one is he says to him, well, if, if you really are the son of God, I mean, throw yourself over this cliff and see if the angels come and rescue you. See if they, if they save you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to demand from God like that. I'm not going to tempt God. He tells the enemy. And every time, every single time, he stands on the authority of a piece of scripture, a piece of the Bible that is obviously woven, woven into his heart. And he speaks that out of humility to the enemy. And what he does is he flips the tables on that stronghold attempt by the enemy by living out of the healthy authority of God, by standing behind the healthy shield of God, by putting on the armor of God that we're gonna talk about later, by not seeing himself as a party of one who is gonna do this on his own and withstand this temptation withstand this set of demands on his own. And it says at the end of the story, the devil, you know, he, the enemy doesn't successfully accomplish in, entwining Jesus into this stronghold that he wanted so much to have for him. But it says something important. It says, when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. And man, there were a bunch of them, but maybe the most famous one is Jesus in the, um, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And if you ever watched the movie, The Passion of the Christ, you'll see in that movie one of the most haunting things I think you're ever gonna see. You'll see the enemy uh, moving in onto Jesus as he's trying to pray in that garden just before he was, he was killed, just before he was crucified. The next opportune moment. And that was at least one of them. The thing about strongholds is, look, there's always gonna be an opportune moment. It isn't like you can, you can see God defeat one in your life and that'll be the one and only you have in your life and now you're good. Kind of like, you, you know, you, got a, you had the measles or the chicken pox or whatever it is. It didn't like that. It didn't like that. Coming. The enemy's coming. We'll never quit until you're not here. And we got to know that because we got to know what is it like to be prepared to deal with these, these stronghold capacities. And one of them is taking our level of pride very seriously. How do we learn to examine what we're so proud of? How do we learn to examine this driving desire for independence? How do we learn to examine the lack of trust that just goes on in us that basically allows the enemy to speak to you, is God really all that trustable? Are you sure that God really loves you? Are you really sure that if Jesus, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, that it wasn't just a historical event? Are you really sure that he died for you? Are you really sure that that should be life-changing for you? Because see, where the enemy wants to lead you, especially with the authority of pride, is to basically have you hear this. Look, I, I mean, I'll tell you what, I can take care of this for you. I mean, I don't know what God's gonna do, but I can take care of this for you. Do you know how I'm gonna do that? I'm gonna show you how to take care of this by yourself. And I wanna say that every compulsion, every stronghold, every addiction continues 
to flourish as long as we continue to believe that we can take care of this or that or the other by ourselves. There's destruction for us in that perspective. The stream is gonna become a waterfall with that and the waterfall is gonna become overwhelming and we're gonna drown. And the way through this is to go, God, I don't even know where to start, but I need for you to start walking with me and showing me how to do this. I wanna start looking up, God, and I wanna start looking into your eyes and I wanna start looking into your love and I wanna start looking into your freedom and I wanna start looking into your strength and I want you to show me how to be free from this. Stronghold of pride. Thanks so much for being a part of this tonight. In Jesus' sweet name, amen.